we are almost to the summer solstice coming up on June 21st. We are trying to get a pool put in and trying to get the ground leveled and all that. So you have to forgive me. We're going to cut this back just a little bit because I have to get back out there. They've had some interesting weather in Nebraska. We're going to start out with a brief tornado that occurs right there at that dot northwest of Lincoln. If we roll that forward, severe storm coming together over Interstate 80. And this is going to be about 1030 last night. There it is. You can see the curl, the very intense echoes, the higher reflectivity gradients on the forward side. This is uh, an HP supercell. And there it is. Tornado warning goes up. Embedded tornado. Let me show you the velocity on that. There it is. There's the couplet, the stronger shear located right in that area. And yeah, that's definitely rain wrapped. So there's our storm heading eastward, but we take a look out west, and this is a very interesting development. Numerous cells, these are all discrete supercells, multi-cells coming together. There's one, two, three, four, five, and then the sixth and seventh one off to the right side of the screen. Then continuing that forward, you can see those cells little marching ants moving eastward, and they are putting out outflow boundaries, so I'm not expecting a whole lot of severe weather in those. And we finish out that animation. There they go. That's 1.44 a.m. We go back to yesterday afternoon. You can see those storms coming together in central Kansas and south-central Nebraska. There it is. First round of storms. Second around Lincoln, and everything just blooms right after dark. And those are going to leave behind numerous boundaries through much of Nebraska, Iowa, and all the way up into Wisconsin. This is about 5 a.m., so I would expect to find boundaries kind of in this area here. Those could be retreating a little bit to the north. Another cell going into western Wisconsin, and that brings us up to the current time right there. Just a little bit of elevated activity up there in northern Wisconsin. However, today we do have a moderate risk in Wisconsin, and those boundaries should be in that area to augment any storms that get going. So we'll just go ahead and cheat and show you what the models are forecasting. This is the high-resolution rapid refresh. Storms expected to get going by mid-afternoon in northeastern Iowa, far southeastern Minnesota and western Wisconsin. Those will push into Wisconsin and looks like numerous severe weather threats through that region. And that brings us up to about 10 p.m. Stuff moving into Michigan and gradually dying off. So the first step in checking out the storm environment is to look at the satellite. I strongly recommend that as a tool when you're kind of jumping in on things, and make sure that it's zoomed in and visible. So here we go. We've got the elevated stuff up to the north. Looks like a boundary extending down into Iowa. And it looks like there's even a small-scale boundary right in here. That's probably some of the outflow from last night. And that appears to be moving very slowly to the north. You can augment that with radar if you suspect something is there. The radar is certainly suggestive of something north of La Crosse that's going to be along that axis. You can see that there is some reflectivity. This is going to be all scatters from like pollen, insects, that kind of thing. However, there's less of it up to the north. So that would mark a air mass discontinuity. Sometimes you can switch over to spectrum width and see the boundaries. Not today. And if that's close enough to the radar, you can actually switch over to some of the clear air reflectivity, and sometimes you'll see anomalies in the zero line and the wind field itself. So those are some things that you would look for. And of course, the surface charts. So I zoomed in a little bit so we can really see things. This is the College of DuPage site, and this does confirm that we are looking at an outflow boundary just to the north. That That's going to be the boundary cooler conditions north of that boundary and down to the south mid 80s 
but the radar does show elevated activity all up and down the front. Some of these storms over the next few hours will become gradually surface-based. I would expect maybe some of the stronger ones to be along that boundary right there, but there could be other unresolved boundaries down to the south that could locally enhance things. And that's what Chuck Doswell refers to as the mesoscale accident. There's no good way to forecast that except through close monitoring of the data, radar, satellite, and some of your diagnostic charts. Let's take a look at the weather around the country this afternoon. There's a polar low in northern Iowa that's probably going to be associated with the stuff developing in Wisconsin later this afternoon. Cold front extending down to the south, and we see the dry line has receded into west Texas. 60s dew points all the way back towards Lubbock and Odessa. And Odessa, I'm not sure if you've heard of that, but their water is completely out for 48 hours due to a water main problem. So entire city of 100, 150,000 people, something like that, is without water. Further to the west, desert conditions, dew points in the 30s. However, we did see earlier during the week that some moisture was forecast to come up, kind of an early onset to the monsoon. And then going further west, cold, polar high settling into the Great Basin area. Temperatures around 60. Normally we should be seeing about 85 or so. So that's definitely very, very cold. And some of that cold weather extending all the way into Montana, Yellowstone, where they've had torrential rains and rains all the way up towards the Canadian prairies. Let's take a look out west into the Pacific. Pretty quiet. This looks like an old dissipating occlusion off of Oregon. Nothing of note in Alaska and Yukon Northwest Territories, but we are expecting a warm-up next week. Should start seeing some 70s and maybe even 80s there in the Northwest Territories. Continued quite cool in the eastern Arctic. Another wave of cold weather moving down Baffin Island, but that's not going to have any effect on the U.S. or southern Canada. In fact, quite warm there with temperatures in the mid-70s all up and down through Quebec. And back into the eastern U.S., a little backdoor front, bringing some cooler air into that region right there. There's the high responsible for that, but we're expecting some of that southerly flow to start impacting this region right here. And those temperatures you can see are quite warm this afternoon. Low 90s with some equally impressive dew points up in the low and mid 70s. There's the temperatures forecast for this afternoon. These are manually produced by a human forecaster at the National Weather Service at each location. So we're expecting 100 degrees at Atlanta. That'll break the record by 4 degrees and looks like even up into Michigan 97, which breaks the record by 5 degrees. This is how it looks for tomorrow. Looks like the main area of concern is going to be Tennessee. 99 at both Nashville and Memphis. For Friday, the heat mostly settling into the southeastern states. 100 degrees in South Carolina, 100 in Jonesboro, Arkansas. A little bit of heat starting to show up there in the Dakotas. However, in the San Joaquin Valley, Stockton, California, expecting a low of 52 on Saturday morning. So it looks like a little bit of cold air starting to work inland. For Sunday, we're starting to see a heat wave take effect there in the northern plains, 102 at Huron, as well as Hastings in Nebraska. Meanwhile, some cool air showing up in the Appalachians. That's probably some cool air on the move southward. That's probably cleared out some of those heat records there in the southeast. Meanwhile, this looks like ridging building into the northern plains. By Monday, we definitely see that heat settling in across Omaha, Columbia, all the way up towards Minneapolis. And it looks like it gets even worse for Tuesday. 101 at St. Louis and 100 at Nashville. So I think climate change is going to be... The topic of discussion in a lot of circles, especially the fact that, you know, we just don't really see any 
cold waves. And I can probably count on one hand the number of widespread cold waves I've seen in the past year. But every day, there's a heat wave somewhere. And this, getting tired of looking at this, this seems to be the new normal. Drought and heat out west and mild weather in the northeast U.S. So enough of that. Let's take a look at the upper air charts. Now, you would think that in June, that upper air charts would not be very important. The jet moves north, the wind flow dies down. Why would you look at these charts? Well, they're actually very important because they tend to control the weather regime that you're under. Up to the north, the northern U.S., obviously those are westerly winds, so that's going to be an active, dynamic weather pattern. However, down to the south, if you really get into this wind data and look around, you can see that there's a upper-level high across Florida. So that's going to keep the precip shut down and result in lower than average chances of thunderstorms. So that is pretty important there. And you can see in Texas, deep southerly flow, and that brings up the moisture in bulk. So what we do is we run this forward and look at the changes. Looks like that upper level high migrates to the west a little bit. That puts Georgia and the Carolinas under northerly flow. And that can sometimes bring down boundaries and increase the chances of rain in those regions. And as that upper level high moves towards Texas, that suggests a very dry weather pattern setting in for this weekend. However, in this case, it looks like a little backdoor front, a series of boundaries that are progressing to the southwest. So the chances of storms may not really be all that small underneath that upper level high. Also ridging across the Rockies, that also tends to shut down precip. Your better sheared storms, your well-ventilated cumulonimbus clouds, those tend to push further north in this kind of weather regime because the upper level flow, the bulk shears are weaker on the Great Plains when we're under this ridge. All right, so where are we? Uh, let's see, go back. Okay, I think we were about right there, Saturday and Sunday. The upper level high builds right back into Texas. In fact, the amplitude is quite high going into Monday and Tuesday, routing that jet stream way up there from the Rockies into the Canadian prairies. Ridging from Texas to Arkansas to Missouri, so that's going to help prolong that heat wave in the Midwest. And let's see the next big change, the Gulf coming under easterly flow for midweek. And that's probably about it, a little bit of northwesterly flow starting to show up in Texas around midweek next week. And the flow becoming much more zonal closing out the last week of June. Okay, time to wrap this up and get it posted. The temperatures have come up there in western Wisconsin, up to 85, up from 78 earlier. And it looks like that little outflow boundary is probably moving north, but definite severe weather chances further south. There's a tornado watch box for most of southern and central Wisconsin. And they're going for a high chance of tornadoes, high chance of severe wind, and also for severe hail. So that's not good news. And one last look at the radar. These are the cells we're going to be concerned with as they move out into Wisconsin. And there could be cells out ahead of the line. I don't see anything obvious at the moment, but, you know, you could have something going up right in that region. And, of course, in some of this stratiform cloud further to the west. Anyway, check that out. That'll give you something to follow. And it should be a bit educational. Hopefully we don't get anything that's too bad. Anyway, we'll go ahead and close this out now. Hope you have a great Wednesday evening. Thank you very much to our new patron, Brian Haggerty. Welcome to the Forecast Lab community. Great to have you on board. And for all of our other supporters, thank you very much for helping to keep the program going. 
We'll see you back here on Friday. Take care. Bye-bye.